I'm telling you, what I'm saying right now is what not to do. If you do just the opposite, you got a shot at it. Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secret successes and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Welcome to the show, and thank you for tuning in. I really appreciate you joining us every week, and if you missed last week's episode, you can hear it at entertalkradio.com slash making it, or go to our app and take us with you. So often I get asked questions about the creative process, so I created this show to focus on what it takes to have a lasting relationship and, and career in the entertainment industry. You're really in for a treat as I've invited some of my friends who are the best in the business to share their stories on how they have influenced actually music and art and culture in our lives. And I guarantee you're going to love it. So let's get started. My guest today is Michael Cole. Michael Cole is an American actor. His career includes leading role as Pete Cochran on the television crime drama, The Mod Squad, which ran from 1968 to 1973. Cole has appeared in numerous films and TV shows beginning in 1961 with the role in the film Forbid Them Not, followed by featured roles on Gunsmoke, Wonder Woman, The Love Boat, Chips, Murder, She Wrote, Fantasy Island, Stephen King's TV movie, It, and General Hospital. His film credits include the 1966 science fiction film, The Bubble, later retitled Fantastic Invasion of Planet Earth, The Last Child, which was nominated in 1971 for Golden Globe Award, and Beg, Borrow, or Steal in 1973. Michael's stage work includes roles on Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, Wait Until Dark, Death of a Salesman, and Dylan in America, just to name a few. Michael considers his greatest accomplishments to be his 21-year marriage to his wife, Shelly, and his 21 years of sobriety. Please welcome my guest today, Michael Cole. Hi, Michael. <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. Uh, you mentioned Shelley and yeah. I would not be here if it was not for my wife. I uh, know that's true. He, he, I think everybody yeah. does. Yeah. Because I've been an alcoholic for a long time. Mm -hmm. And she got me to go to Betty Ford's. Right. And um, that I get a little bit choked up when I think about it. Of but uh, I am so lucky, so lucky to have her and sobriety for 20 some years now. Yeah. But, uh, Anyway, thank you. You're welcome. You, you said just sort of in passing, you've been an alcoholic for a long time, but you're not kidding. You're talking about, you started drinking when you were nine years old? Probably. Or when you were a kid. Yeah, as, lo as long as you're old enough to steal. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> just about. So you mastered two skills at the same yeah. time as, as a young <laughs> lad. <laughs> um, there's... Yeah, there's two places I would be right now if it wasn't for Shelley. Yeah. I'd either be in jail or drunk. Uh -huh. Or maybe both. Yeah. But uh, I owe her. And and I never call them fans. This is you call Terry. them friends, don't you? Yes. I, I There's still, still a lot of them out there. And right. I'm so flattered and so, it's, it's, so moved. It's, this is... 50 years. And are these friends, fans, um, people that knew you before Mod Squad or f from mm -hmm. Mod Squad have, have they followed you since? And All the way through. Yeah. All the way through. Um, they're, 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 we were together. There's what they call the, I don't, the Prime Nine. Right. And, oh, right, right. And, I, and I, I love every one of them. We just became... I said, wait a minute, you're not fans. I mean, you're not friends. You are you are friends, you're not fans. Yeah. So let's start there and get it, uh, get all that stuff out of the way because we really all are on the same page. Well, you know, one of the, the things that fascinates me about your life, and I know about your life because I read your book, which we will be talking about and, and you'll read a little bit from, as we go, um, but also just us being friends. I, I, I know that you basically got shot out of a cannon when, when you ended up on a hit TV show. 
So everything, you know, learning about fans and, and privacy and all of a sudden becoming a public figure and um, making money when you were living, you know, basically yeah. squ squatting at, at, at a theater you know, and was. I, on a bed that was a prop on a stage. <laughs> was, yeah, you, know, you know, like you come from, let's talk about where you come from. You, you were born on the cusp of the Depression, you know, in 1940, Madison, Wisconsin. And I um, had my own depression. Yeah, and you had your own depression. <laughs> yeah. um, you never met your biological dad. You grew up in your grandmother's house with your mom and your brother. Didn't grow up. Okay. That's where we started. But uh, my mother was fabulous. Yeah. To keep myself and my brother and Ten. her together. Yeah. And we went looking for him once. I re can really remember when I was like two, three years old. Yeah. We went down to Dallas looking for him on a train. And um, it was rough. We didn't have a dime. Right. And. Mm -hmm. You and mom and Ted? And Ted, yes. Right. And uh, anyway, we got down there and there was nobody around. Hmm. So um, that was it. We had to go back to Madison and it was tough. It was, it was tough for quite a few years there. But uh, yeah. and, when, and when you say tough, I mean, you're not kidding. Like you didn't have hot no. water in your grandmother's house. No, we didn't. There was a commode down in the basement. That would freeze. That would freeze. Yeah. And right, uh, Madison. In Madison, Wisconsin. The night I left to, I was married when I was 16, and we can get into that. Yeah, I mean, you dropped out of high school and got married and had a kid. Two kids. Two kids. When you were a teenager. 16. 16. Uh, wow. What, what, what was I? Uh, I was going to say, like, we were talking about, I got married when I was 16, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And we lived, when it's cold in Wisconsin, Yeah, it's cold. Yes, sir. The <laughs> night I left, I, I got in a lot of trouble <laughs> from time to time. Time to time? <laughs> Hard to believe. <laughs> um, the night I left, it was 30 below. Oh. And, <laughs> and I, I'd never had a cold in my life. Right. You know, when it's zero, you're running around in your t-shirts. But I went to Vegas first for some reason. Mm -hmm. And um, then I got pneumonia from leaving Wisconsin. And going to the desert. And going to the desert, wow. yes. But it was the right thing to do. Right. I met some incredible people there. and. I've been an alcoholic for a long time, mm -hmm. as you know. And uh, being a bartender in Vegas really was the wrong place for me. Yeah. But I got to meet some incredible people. Mm -hmm. uh, Bobby Darren was one. Who you met while you were bartending? Yeah. So this was before you got known as an actor? Right. And I, I said to Mr. Darren, um, you know, I really. I want to be an actor. Mm -hmm. And he said, Michael, do it now. Hmm. Do it right now. Because if it's inside and it's burning, yeah. it's going to happen. Right. That's why you're here. Right. I said, thank you, Mr. Darren. And those words stayed with me for many, many years yeah. after I left Vegas and uh, <laughs> just slept under the freeways and did all that stuff. Literally. Yep, and um, I, I call it just like, hey, Jack Kerouac was on the road. Sure. Why can't yeah. Michael, you be on the right. road. Right, And um, it's, so as I'm, as I'm doing this, I, I started bartending. Mm -hmm. and, um, and a producer came in, was right across the street from a, beautiful theater, the Huntington Hartford. And the cast would come in after the show mm -hmm. and they would be talking about acting and et cetera, et cetera. And I, something started to really tingle, to ring in there and f feeling. 
There's a term in acting called emotional recall. Mm-hmm. And that started to really have every, every tear, every heartache, every laugh uh, is emotionally attached still in there. Mm-hmm. And um, so the, anyway, this producer came in one night from across the street from this theater and uh, and he said, Michael, I understand you want to be an actor. How did you, some of the cast told me. Right. And uh, said, I think you should go for it. I've got a good sense about this. Mm-hmm. And, and so he said, but you have to study first. Right. Now I hated <clears throat> school. I love <laughs> education, but I hated school. It's funny that you say that. And there is a difference it's sometimes, a t- unfortunately. Tremendous difference. Right. So uh, uh, he mentioned the magic name for me, which was Estelle Harmon. Estelle, yeah. And Estelle was uh, a beautiful was acting a, coach. Oh, man. She, she was a heavyweight. Mm-hmm. And uh, I didn't, I wasn't <laughs> sleeping under, you know, in the freeways and stuff. And we met, and she said, Here, she, I just went over there. I didn't know who the hell she was, or right. really. Or the, she said, "Here, take this." Mm-hmm. She handed me a page mm-hmm. from All My Sons. It was an incredible movie, mm-hmm. and uh, written by Arthur Miller. Right. And uh, she said, "Take this and come back in a couple minutes, and I'll read it with you, because there's different stages mm-hmm. for her classes." So I just went out there. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. But it, it, it was about this guy, this bastard that was making airplanes and cheating a bit. Mm-hmm. And a lot, we lost a lot of pilots during the war because of his making money. Right. And I played his son in the scene. Estelle read, the, read his part. And I, that was getting me really kind of pissed off to me. Whoa, and I started finding this character all in 15 minutes or so. And I went back in and Estelle was sitting there and and she she threw me a couple of lines and basically I forgot about the script. And I looked, but all of a sudden I was there in my heart. Saying to us, still, you son of a bitch. You knew that these planes were defective. And you let them go out and you let the, our guys, our American pilots, fly them so you could make some more money? Fuck you. Right. And I walked out. And I, geez, what was that all about? <laughs> and Estelle, when I went back in, Estelle said, I want you to stay. I had didn't have a dime, right. but she just let me stay, and she said, "You don't have a, you don't have a room or anything, do you? Said, a room? I don't even have a jacket. Right. Uh, um, <clears throat> you can sleep on the bed that's on the stage wow. at the workshop. How generous! It was beautiful. But she, she also never saw charged it. me a dime. She never, never. But she she's recognized a gift in you um, that. You felt that you had. Yeah, I mean, you had an intuition. Oh, it's not. <clears throat> and you had a fire in your belly about it. But but she saw that, crystal Thank clear. Thank God. Yeah. Thank God. And um, it's, thank God for our mentors and teachers, the good ones. Yes. They mm-hmm. will find. Estelle found out with me anyway. Mm-hmm. What the hell I was all about before I ever was on a stage. And uh, I, I, I said to myself, Jesus, this is, well, she recognized right. what was in there. And uh, before I did, and she never tried to teach me because if she tried to teach me, I would have been the first one to say, fuck you, right. I'm out of here, the same as school. I remember Michael reading a quote of yours that said, 
I always had a little test. If I didn't oh, yeah. remember exactly yeah. what had happened in the scene, I knew it must be okay because that meant it was natural. It, I wasn't thinking about words or lines. It's, for me, that yeah. was kind of my own uh, actor's workshop inside my, right. my heart. And, and I learned that, and Estelle helped me develop that. And if and it really makes sense too. If you don't, if you're worrying about the lines and stuff like that, mm -hmm. you uh, you're gonna say them, and that's gonna be part of the line. Right. And you don't mean to say it. Right. Right. Uh, like that. That makes sense. And uh, it's got to be so, the same with music. So yeah, it is very much so. Very yeah. much. So um, I started. Okay, this is really. It's almost scary to think back. Um, in one day, hmm. one of the students at Estelle's Actors Workshop had a meeting and a reading at Paramount. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd never been in a studio, <laughs> let alone work. Sure. And anyway, we went over there and she did a scene and uh, the director was there. And he said, very good, guys, very good. And she, the girl went away off into the catacombs to get wardrobe mm -hmm. and all that stuff like that. And I was leaving. And the casting director said, wait a minute, Michael. I want to talk to you. I didn't do it. I, actually, <laughs> I didn't do it, sir. <laughs> and and uh, his name was Eddie Morris. Uh -huh. He called me back in. And he said, I want you to take this. And he gave me a scene. Right. This was written by Sterling Siliphant. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Come back later this afternoon, about 4 o'clock. Mr. Siliphant will be here. And I want you to read this scene. Find a partner over at Stell's. Right. Well, wow. man, I'm sweating thinking about it. Um, Anyway, we went back over to Estelle's and uh, said, here, we got to, I didn't understand half of it, mm -hmm. but it was going to be a series that Mr. Siliphant was going to do at, with Paramount. And uh, I, 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 I really didn't know what the hell I was doing. Mm -hmm. But in a way, I was thankful because if you know too much about the whole thing, you have a tendency to act that. Right. Instead you're, of you're more in your yes, your head than your heart. Yes, exactly. Okay. And um, so I went over the thing with Estelle, and we, then we went back over to Paramount. And sure as hell, there's Sterling Silver. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Um, you know, an Academy Award winning guy. He, yeah. he wrote a little thing called In the Heat of the Night. Yeah. And stuff <laughs> like that. And uh, we read, uh, we did the scene. And it was about a young guy, a young writer, coming down from San Francisco. Mm -hmm. who's going to break into show business. And he had a motorcycle. And the bags were full of scripts and stuff he'd written. Um, so the, the scene takes place w w when I get to L.A. and I've got these these scripts and I basically tell everybody that you're full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> Which was not the first or last time no, that no, you would actually no, no, say those it. words. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, yeah, why did... <clears throat> That's I, interesting. I was my own worst, best enemy right. at those times. Yeah. It was my James Dean period. Yeah. You know, Brando was just changing everything. So how did that, that go, that audition? So I, I said, Mr. Soliphant, it was very nice to meet you, sir. Said, and he comes walking over to me. Shh, right about this far. <laughs> and I'm looking in his eyes. I want to do this show with you. Wow. That's great. What? 
<laughs> <laughs> right. And uh, it just so happens that a great agent who had a beautiful stable was walking down the hall and sat in and happened to see that. This is one afternoon. He came, well, he came up to me and said, Michael, you want to sign with me? Your whole world shifted in that, that in, one in a couple hours, like, moment. Yes. And I absolutely just come up to my office tomorrow. And, just, and also the, the, the coolest thing for me about this story is that that shift that happened in that one moment was that moment that you just happened to go with a friend. It wasn't even about you. Absolutely. Yeah. I was on my way out. And they, they stopped me. And, uh, so he said he wanted you? Yes. Now, we're, Hollywood's a small town. Mm -hmm. Word was getting around. Excuse me, I gotta get a, a little sip, a sip of, this. of water. Yeah. Um, you know what I'm doing? I'm emotionally recalling that. Right now. Yeah. Yeah. And that's my mouth is getting. <sighs> Thank you. Yeah, of course. I don't know where the hell was I. Uh, um, so he hired he. he Oh, the agent wanted to sign. Yeah, it. the agent wanted yes. to sign, and uh, phone rings, mm -hmm. and the casting director picks it up. and says, oh, "Michael, it's for you." <laughs> Who the hell knows? I where? <laughs> no, nope. ah, what? He said, "Yeah, it's pretty important. I think you better talk to this guy." I said, Hello. This guy says. Uh, my name is Howard Koch. I am the president of Paramount Studios. I want to see you tomorrow, Michael, because I want to set up. I want to set up a, a, a staging, and we're going to do a screen test for you. <laughs> it's kind of In surreal. One afternoon. One afternoon. Yes, and uh, I. I, I, I I, I I didn't know what the hell was. Okay, thank you, sir. And uh, they gave me the casting people and the agent, whatever, gave me a, a reading to do that scene that we just did right. for the um, screen test. Right. And so I went out, ran over to Estelle's, mm -hmm. the workshop. And she was standing out in front with a huge smile she on her face. <laughs> she already knew that. Right. And that's how it all started. But Mr. Seliphant, God rest his brilliant soul, uh, got in a big argument with the networks and all that stuff, mm -hmm. as, as artists do, as you well know. Yeah. And uh, I... I finally went up to Sid's office, and he said something about, there's somebody I want you to meet now, because Silphant has said this and that, and the mm -hmm. casting people over at Parent. His name is Aaron Spelling. Wow. Aaron Spelling, that's okay, I yeah. don't care. I'm still in my James Dean. <laughs> You're still pissed. <laughs> yeah, at the world. Right, just and just angry for the sake of being angry. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I never thought of that. Yeah. And the and, um, first time I went into... See, I, I guess I have a history of fucking things up uh -huh. that could be absolutely great. You had a history. I had, yeah. Thank you, you. You've rewritten that one. Thank you, thank you, Dick. Um, and then anyway, I go. I go into Aaron's office. The agents finally, it beads of perspiration, all of them, <laughs> and stuff like that. And I said, "All right, all right, all right. I'll go meet this guy." And uh, at that time, Aaron was getting ready to do a show. Mm -hmm. So I go in there, and Aaron is only about this big. Yeah, you know, it's about <laughs> this big around, and. Uh, I, you know, I said, hey, how are you doing, Aaron? And, he, and I remembered exactly. He said, he launched into his pitch, if you will. Was Danny Thomas there too? Who, or no, not, Danny not was yet. not there Because he was one of the producers they, of the show. Yeah, they were partners, okay. but Danny was down the hall Got or it. wherever. And Aaron wrote it, actually. He did? 
Yeah, and so That's great. I uh, I said to Aaron, "Wait a minute, what's the name of this?" Uh -huh. He said, "Mod Squad." Oh man, <laughs> that's the dumbest <laughs> shit I ever heard of in my life. <laughs> to well, Aaron Spelling, the yeah, writer of it, right there. <laughs> right there. I said, "You know what? Find somebody. Give me a goddamn part with a. Give me a motorcycle. Let me be a bad guy. Right. Do, and I, whatever. Let me be me." Right. And I started to walk out, and Aaron jumped up on his desk, and he said, "Michael, you are you. That's exactly what I wanted." Right. I said, I, I, I want you to do this. You're the first one I'm casting for this. You, and that's how it happened. Wow. And, uh, and that's how you ended up yeah. in Mod Squad. I, I don't yeah. suggest that for any other actors, <laughs> right. young actors, right. to do This that. is a little bit of a mentoring show. So, if you're wondering, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> yeah. I'm telling you, what I'm saying right now is, what not to do. If you do just the opposite, you got a shot at it. <laughs> But it worked beautifully for you. It sure did. And then, yeah, like the next day we met, next couple of days we met uh, Clarence Williams mm -hmm. and Peggy. So Clarence was, who played Link, was a Broadway actor. Absolutely respected. We had done some of his stuff as Slow Dance on a Killing Ground. Okay. That's what he won, he won right. an Emmy right. for, it, or was nominated or something. And, uh, and Peggy Lipton also had a she fair was, amount of acting experience she as was well. under contract to oh, right to paramount at right. the time and so uh aaron had to really use the tweezers to right. get her out of that sure and anyway the three of us when we finally met and this it's in the That's, book yeah but the moment when you all first met do you want me to say that because it's in yeah the book. sure okay yeah we're staying clarence and i were staying in a hotel do you want to read it or do you want to say it i'll tell Just it because i don't know well, we're staying in a hotel on Sunset Boulevard. Yeah. I said to myself, man, this is a hell of a long way from the, where I used to drink in Madison, Wisconsin, <laughs> standing on Sunset, waiting for you to get. Anyway, this little red Porsche, it was raining. Mm -hmm. you know, this little red Porsche, James Dean type Porsche, right. comes screaming around the corner, fishtail, etc., <laughs> and hit the brakes. <laughs> and Clarence and I said, it's Peggy. <laughs> Uh, and she said, come on, guys, get in. <laughs> and, and so she, yeah, 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 man, okay, Peg. Nobody else on the street, dark, right. raining like hell. Peg reaches into her basket, her handbag or wherever yeah. it was, pulls out a joint. <laughs> <laughs> I can say like that you do. Yeah. <laughs> and rolls it perfectly. While she's, she's driving shifting, and shifting? Shifting and the whole thing. That's a mad girl. little porch. <laughs> and, um, yeah. And she passed it around, and at that moment, I'm convinced yeah. we made the Mod Squad. Right, right there. We were never, ever not loving each other. Right, right, yeah. And that was so powerful. Yeah. And that's what came across this, this on the screen. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure, and they had to write that. And I said, first of all, Aaron, we're not, I'm not carrying a gun. Right. We're not going to be undercover cops. Right. You know, this is not dragnet. He right. said, no, no, no. Right. It's, it's about caring. Hmm. And that's, that really hooked me. Right. Because, uh, and the rest kind of is and TV you, history, really. Yeah, it, it really is history. I mean, it's your personal history, but it's our cultural history. Yes. Because we came up with that show. We all, I connected with it when I watched it. That's so beautiful, man. Oh, yeah, Michael. And, so beautiful. And it's, um, and, you know, I guess I didn't, I suppose I realized it at the time, but it just felt sort of very natural and right, and it was in the, it was woven into the tapestry of the writing of the yes. show and the acting, but you were covering racism, abortion, um, uh, physical abuse, uh, absolutely. Like it, you know, um, let alone the drugs, drug abuse, Vietnam, Vietnam War. Uh, there was like it was a pretty fearless it, show. Aaron fought like hell to get all this stuff in, and there. you took you all took a lot of heat. We did. There was some hate mail. I'll never forget one time. Yeah, 
like maybe two, three shows into the mm -hmm. season. Ty Ganders, the guy who played the cop, yeah. our mentor, like, was shot. And um, Clarence has got to, we're out in the desert, and Clarence has got to dig the bullet out. And it was hot as hell. And he's like, really trying to not to hurt Ty, but still get, and he was perspiring. Yeah. And, uh, I reached in, I ripped my shirt like that. I reached in, and I had a big head close up of Clarence, of course. I reached in and I mopped his brow right. to keep the sweat from going in his eyes. Like any friend or brother would do. Oof. He, he, he was, uh, yeah. Bang. The next day, there was hate mail from certain places. And um, <laughs> it was, how, how could a white guy? mop a black man's brow wow yeah and i grabbed that i wrote it down and i ran down to aaron's office and i said look i know we're on the right track yeah. now <laughs> so that didn't piss you off it actually yeah like, no it, it just the whole we came back and the crew <laughs> applauded everybody you know just like, it, it was that's fantastic it was really neat and we went on for five years trying to right some wrongs. That yeah. We had to plant a lot of seeds, though, and I think we did with that show. Yeah, there was, it was a different time in television. Absolutely. Um, where there were shows that were, some of them were even comedies, but they were, oh. they were pushing the envelope in our culture right. to, to create some sort of a positive shift. This was, and I've always said, to like, well, we had to go on a PR tour, mm -hmm. right? Clarence and I. Mm -hmm. Not Peggy. No, Peggy was doing her own stuff. Right. And it was this black guy and this white guy, right? Mm -hmm. And we, we, we were planned to go to like 10, 15 towns and make appearances to mm -hmm. sell the show. Second time, second town we got in, we got in a big goddamn argument with the press people that were covering right. it. Right. The thing. And, uh, one guy asked me something that really upset me. Mm -hmm. And I said, why do you bastards always have to try and make it racial? Right. I, I swear to God, I never thought about racial shit before. And he said, how do I write that? You know, like I said <laughs> right, before. right. Right, and... Uh, ABC called and said, get these guys home. <laughs> <laughs> right, you couldn't be left no. unsupervised. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to put it, yes. I, uh, let's, the Watts Riot was going on then. Right, yeah. Maybe we started it. Mm, no, no, I don't no, think no, you no, started no, that. No, no. <laughs> you might have poured a little gas on the fire, but it was good. a fire that needed to burn. Good, yes. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk about your book. And the, the book is called, I Played the White Guy. Great title, <laughs> kind of self-explanatory. Uh, but I wanna read uh, a okay. description of the book um, that was written by uh, Jennifer Aguilar in Goodreads. And here's what, what she said. This is a story of love. This is a story of love so deep as to conquer a 40-year addiction. In this story, Mr. Cole gives us an honest look at humanity, youth, and the gift of imperfection a courageous and relatable trip through the detours a life takes. The author writes with an empathetic vulnerability that makes for great realism. The characters are fully human, especially his brother, mother, and amazingly strong wife, who ultimately gives him the final push to reach the mountaintop. It's engaging, heartbreaking, and uncomfortable, but also warm, uplifting, and gives you faith in the human spirit. One might even believe they're a better person for having read it which really sums up the book. And I wanna read one other quote from somebody who I know um, we were both touched by, um, Senator John McCain. Um, Very. Whoa. And I was just watching part of the, the funeral the other day and, and, and somebody read this quote of his and it, it made me think of you. Really? He, 
he said, life without passion and love is a sad life. And that just yeah. spoke to me. Sure does me. Yeah. <clears throat> now I'm lucky enough to have found Shelley. Yes. Yeah. They've been sober for a long time. Yeah. I'm sorry, I've got choked up over that. Yeah. That was a. Uh, that was. Pretty, can I just read something? I would from, love that. From the book. Yeah. This is a. Uh, this is me thinking about something. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the way I had to wind it up. How are we doing on time? We're good. Okay. Um, if there's one thing I've learned from this crazy, tumultuous life with its stratospheric highs and suicidal lows, is to live one day at a time. I have at least made peace with myself and let go of a, a lifetime of guilt and anger. I feel a tremendous sense of gratitude for the many blessings I've been giving. For the first time, things are truly as they should be according to God's plan, not mine. <laughs> Thank you for letting me yeah. share that. That's this book, which I, I read, is, is it's a beautiful book. And I, um, you know, one of the things, of course, it's fun to read the history of you and Gunsmoke and Mod Squad and Cat on a Hot Tin Roof and all, you know, all yeah. the, the, um, the, out in the world things, you know, that we knew about you. Um, but I really felt like I got to know who you are from reading this book. Like, I felt like I knew you after I read it. That's exact. thank you. That's exactly what I was trying to do. And like I said, I quit school in eighth grade. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I said that. So yeah. I, I really can't spell. And somebody said, as a matter of fact. Are you a good reader? Yes, once I get going. Yeah, but that's like you I, enjoy reading. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, but what a person told me this is you're gonna write a book, huh? <laughs> Why don't you read one first? It's <laughs> <laughs> a it's a good that start. So <laughs> cool. Yeah, that was beautiful. That's and, very funny. Yeah, and so anyway, I started. I just started to write down how to. How, where do you start? Well, it's not a bad place to start at the beginning. Right. And um, I can read another passage if, you, if there's time. Yeah. Or. And did you, Michael, did you write this book more for you or was it to be of service and to help other people? Both. Both. Absolutely both because it's part of being an alcoholic to me. And part of the recovery. Absolutely. Right. And I wound up at the end talking about that. Shelley got me to into Betty Ford. Yeah. And uh, that was a, a really courageous move, I think, on Shelley's it was, part. It was, I've never experienced love like that. Although yeah. it might have been the only move at that point. It was. Too. It was for her, too. Yeah. For her. And then I, I walked in the room and I, in a room, and I'd already been talking to this guy about getting sober and stuff mm -hmm. like that. This yeah. guy meaning a counselor? Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. And um, he's sitting there. Shelley's sitting there. It's another guy from, uh, I think, from SAG, because mm -hmm. they have a program. Oh, anyway. Right. I said, uh oh. What's going on? I'm really busted. Right. Shit. And the, when the counselor guy stands up and he says, Michael, whatever I can do for you, it's not working. I can't take your money anymore because you're still drinking. And it, it's wrong for Shelley and it's wrong for, wrong for everybody. Right. 
especially yourself. Right. And uh, within a week or something like that, Shelley was driving me down the Betty Fords. And I had, I, I hadn't had a drink in like 23 or four years mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. And never missed it because it, the power of her loving me and me realizing that was what it was, it was to keep back or kill yourself. Right. Because you found this remarkable woman that you loved and who Absolutely. loved you. Absolutely. We, we, the night we met, we hmm. just started talking. Mm -hmm. A friend introduced us. Right. Do you got fixed up or? No. You just, you just got introduced. You got introduced. And she was so pretty. She still is. She, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And uh, so smart. Mm -hmm. We started talking about everything from the Lakers, the LA <laughs> Lakers, to. Uh, because she was a big person in advertising, like with Rolling Stone magazine right. and GQ and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And man, so smart. Yeah. Uh, uh, that I, I didn't want it to end. I asked her if she would come up. I was living in the woods by myself. Totally. When isolated. you say in the woods, did you have a cabin or we yeah, a tent? Yeah, cabin. <laughs> a cabin. Okay. This was a couple of years. And it was literally a log cabin. Right. It was built in 1928. But anyway, mm -hmm. Shell was a little leery about going up. It, was that pop for us? I do not know. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently. Uh, she, she, she followed me up to the cabin. And she came in and we talked and talked and talked and played Bob Dylan's. Uh, what, the, what, what was it? Uh, a lot of Bob Dylan yeah. stuff. And uh, knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Right. That's what I felt like I was just doing when I was oh, with perfect. Shirley. perfect. I know. It, it, didn't, it, all, it all came together. And um, I, I, she had to go. It was really getting late. She's got to get up in the morning. And so I... She followed me down the hill, and uh, st we stopped at the main street mm -hmm. so she could find find her way home. And I said, "Can I see you tomorrow?" I didn't want her right. to go, and uh, she said, "It already is tomorrow." <laughs> <laughs> it's <was> pretty witty. <laughs> and uh, did you kiss her goodbye? Yes. It wasn't goodbye though. Well. Did you kiss her good morning <laughs> or good no, night? I just kissed her. <laughs> you kissed her. Okay. And yeah. uh, and I went back up to the uh, to the cabin. Right. And waited a couple of minutes because uh, she had to get give her a chance to get home. Mm -hmm. And I called and left a message. I just wanted to make sure you got home safe. Yeah. And she called back and she's that meant so much to her. Mm hmm that we started, it was to see her again. Yeah. And again. And again. Right. And again. And that was 20 some years wow. ago. So, so I love that story. Thanks. Um, so, she, so Shelly was the, the catalyst to get you into Betty Ford. And I know that um, from reading about it, that that was not an easy experience or, or easy time, but you, you, you got through it together. And yes. I know in some ways that um, that must have brought you closer. Um, but then you had another experience as a couple later w involving cancer. Yeah, I have what, I don't know what I, yes. Somebody told me, you've got cancer. Mm -hmm. I think prostate or some one of those things mm -hmm. down there. Right. Down there. <laughs> yeah, in there somewhere. <laughs> Been cut on so many times. What's left. Right. Um, and and they took it out. Yeah. And I couldn't remember. So I think so it got something something to do with selective memory or something mm -hmm. like that. Because Shelley came home the next day and 
said something about cancer. I said, what? Who? Me? Bullshit. I don't have cancer. I totally blocked it out. Mm -hmm. There's a term for that. And, yeah. and uh, we beat that. Together. Absolutely. You, but, now wait a minute. Yes, then the story gets even more yeah. interesting. Shelly goes to the doctor. Right. I don't know how many months or a year later or something like that. She's got cancer. Right. I cannot lose this lady. I cannot lose this lady. She went and had hers done. Mm -hmm. uh, cancer free. Both of you. Yes. And that was, that, that was <laughs> for Ma. What a blessing. It sure was. This has been a blessing, my friend. Michael, um, <laughs> I have so many things that I want to ask know, you. Me too, right? and, and <laughs> um, I just want to ask you a couple things really quick because we're towards the end of our show. Although um, You said it was going to go. Yeah. It. However, um, I'd love to have you back sometime, you know, and, and, and continue the Tomorrow. conversation. <laughs> Tomorrow. <laughs> That'd be fine with me. Um, before I get to my closing question, um, oh man, there's so much to cover. Um, I want to just, actually, can you read this? This is uh, from your book. It's from chapter seven, and it's about fame. Wow. Would you prefer I read it? Uh, it's going to... Fame, fame is being a crossword puzzle clue. Fame is being an answer on Jeopardy. Fame is being on the cover of, this is one of my favorites, of Mad Magazine. Mad Magazine. Yes. Wow. <laughs> Fame is some crazy shit. Before you know it, weird things begin happening to you. With fame comes money, and when you have money, you start buying stuff, and the next thing you know, people are trying to steal it from you. And if you're anything like me, you end up in your driveway naked shooting a gun at a complete stranger <laughs> who just <laughs> broke into your car. <laughs> you told more. That's great. That's that's. I could do it's, this all day with you. you know, that's your life. I mean, it's yeah, it's no, been amazing. Uh, I, <laughs> I I did. Let me ask you a quick question before I ask my closing questions. Um, when you, you know, started to become famous and started to make money, which was the complete opposite of the way you grew up and the way most of us grew up. Did you have a financial advisor? Did you have a plan? Did you have people showing you how to save for this point of your life now to, so that you would be? Thank God. I, I, I did. Okay. And this agent that I mentioned before. Right. You got a business manager. Good. Otherwise, I would have been right back in right. Wisconsin. Right. The same bar stool, right? And um, so you got good counsel, good advice, good guidance. Yes, I, yeah, I did. Thank God. I'm glad to hear that. Um, let me um, end by um, asking you the closing question that I ask all of my guests. The first is a two-part question. This show is called Making It. What does making it mean to you, both personally and professionally? And also, can you give three tips that have um, propelled your career? Three tips, points yeah, of advice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, every time I've done a play, I've been asked to like come out and talk to the students in the drama department, mm -hmm. which is basically the audience. And I said, I want to ask you three questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. First of all, how many of you think you're a good actor. Everybody raise their hands. <laughs> so, okay. If you're bullshitting, you're only bullshitting yourselves, right. not me. Right. Um, second question is, how, how, uh, how do you think you could handle yourself if you were on stage or in a film with George C. Scott? Mm -hmm. It's just not bad. 
or Marlon Brando. Right. And, and you can really hold your own and give them something that they can come back at you with. And about a third, third or so, the people raised their hands. Mm -hmm. And I said, the last question is, how many of you, and please be honest, how many of you have no choice? Because it's what you are. Mm -hmm. and you know that as a wonderful musician. Mm -hmm. And maybe three, four people would kind of reluctantly raise their hand. Mm -hmm. That's who I want to work with. Right. Um, I'm sorry. I, I, no, it's a, it's a, those are three, those are three great questions. And, and they actually, um, they serve the purpose for what I was asking. Okay. Um, wh what about making it? What do, you, what do you consider making it in life, professionally and personally? I never thought about it professionally. But like, so personally? Yeah, like personally, it, it was all the stuff that I went through, experienced, mm -hmm. that made me so pissed off to begin with, right. that I was finally able to use oh, in beautiful. this creative way. Right. And uh, th 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 that, I was really thankful for there's um hmm. the, I wrote something in there, but probably don't have time to yeah. um, about being a kaleidoscope right and that was me of all these emotions right. and stuff like that and finally they were set in place right by acting and the and the acting allowed you correct me if I'm wrong because this is you I'm talking about, but it, it allowed you to turn that anger into passion or funnel it, it I express it. Because Estelle with passion. had a lot to do with it, did and she? so did Shelley. Yeah. Um, confidence and being loved. Right. I, I really couldn't be pissed off anymore right. at a lot of people, sure. just in general. Right. I'm loved. My spiritual side has been awakened. Mm -hmm. um, it's all, I wouldn't be here with you right now, Terry. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, wasn't for that. And uh, yeah. now you're getting me choked up again because I'm just so bloody thankful. Yeah, that's a beautiful thing. Thankful. I, I, res you know I respect what? that in you. Thank you. Yeah. It's people ask, how do you get to be there? How do you do this and all that stuff like that? You gotta just follow your instincts. If it seems right, you gotta do it, mm -hmm. Hmm. and it'll be right. Right. Don't give up. Stick your ass in the wind and don't give up. Got it. And if you don't, and there's some talent or something like that still beating inside you it'll kill you right because it'll rip you apart it's its own entity right it will take your heart out and shove it down your throat so just simply pay attention to those feelings that are inside and don't give up because there is no other way to go yeah other than knocking yourself off alcoholism, uh, drugs or something, you know, just anything to cover. Yeah. It's just suppress that honest feeling. That's, uh, I've been lucky enough to sense that. Yeah. And to learn it. Thank God for Shelley. <laughs> Thank God for Shelley. Ooh. Let me ask you our final question and it can be a, a really simple one sentence answer. Um, and with, at this point of your life, Michael, with everything that you know to be true, if you could, what would you tell your younger self? That's a great question. Because I've always had the feeling, wait a minute, if I wouldn't have done all this bullshit, I wouldn't have those emotions to right. pull out to act with. Right. So. Maybe nothing. 
Ah. Except maybe, except perhaps meeting <laughs> Shelley sooner. Don't forget to meet Shelley. <laughs> yeah. But uh, that's kind of true. I'll never forget the last time I was arrested. Mm -hmm. I was in jail and I had this. I was 16 or something like that, 15, and, and my mother had to come and get me. And I had to, you know, you through the glass and you're sitting there in the orange jumpsuit and, and I saw her and she was crying, mm -hmm. really crying. And uh, even the cops, the cops started to tear up a bit. And that was, I was very, very close to being sent away for a long time. But uh, I'm sorry, I got emotional. Again. It's okay. Yeah, it I bad. want to um, thank you for, for being so honest and, and opening your heart and your book and, and your story. Um, everybody, um, Michael Cole, um, go buy this book. Um, it's you'll feel like you really get to know this gentleman that's sitting next to me and and uh, it's up on Amazon and any place you can find a book uh, and go watch some old Mod Squad episodes and and oh, and God. all the, the beautiful work that you've done um, thank you for spending the hour with me I really appreciate Jerry, you God bless thank you you too do you know the Irish prayer tell us may the road rise up to greet you May the wind always be at your back. May the sunshine warm upon your face. May the rain fall soft upon your fields. Until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. And may you be in heaven a half an hour before the devil knows you're dead. God bless. <laughs> I mean that with all my heart, Terry. Amen. Thank you. Man. Thank you. Everybody, Michael Cole, thank you for spending the hour with us. And uh, we'll see you all next week. <laughs>